Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Apa kabar? This is Steve Darby, and you're listening to the Bola Bola Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of the Bola Bola Show podcast. And as always, I'm here by my two co-hosts. First and foremost, Elwin. How's it going, Elwin? Hey, Steven. I'm doing fantastic here and uh, feeling very pumped up today about the episode. Looking forward to another awesome episode today. What about you, Bala? Hi, Elwin and Steven. It's been a while. Um, I'm, at, I'm actually also very excited for today's episode. Uh, one of the, uh, I think one of these, uh, I would say, celebrity in our show today, Elwin. Yes, guys. So today on our show, we have a very special guest. Uh, you have seen him on TV being a football pundit in recent years. Today, we'll get to know him a bit better in terms of his managerial career and also to have his insights on this beautiful game. So the Bola Bola Show is proud to bring to you guys the one, the only, Mr. Steve Darby. Hello, Steve. Welcome to our show. So how things have been for you and your family? Terimakasi, apakaba. But uh, I think the rest of my word speak, speaking will be in English. My Bahasa is fading now. I'll have to watch some more P. Ramley films, which is how I learned to speak Bahasa. Yeah. Yeah, I used to, sit on the, used to sit on the bus with the Johor lads and I would watch P. Ramley with subtitles. And he spoke very, very good Bahasa, by the way. Better than my Johor lads. They, they taught me... Uh, Makan, Chido, Do It, Jalan Jalan, Fujimata. Uh, they taught me all the important words in Malay. Ah, uh, okay. okay. Oh. All right. As, as, of course, uh, you know, Johor was one of the few teams that you coached during your managerial career, which we will get into them shortly. But uh, first and foremost, Steve, I want, just wanted to ask you, you know, at, at what stage you decided that you wanted to hang your boots uh, from playing football and going to coaching? And what was your first coaching job? Um, what was it the Bahrain national team, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, basically, I, I was lucky, really. My, uh, my playing career was halted by a severe lack of ability. Uh, some people are get by injuries, but mine was by, by being not good enough. So I ended up going, from, <laughs> I ended up going out at the age of 24 to, uh, to Bahrain. I was player coach with a club called East Rafah. And then when the club... When the national team went into uh, into into games, the, the league went into hibernation, and I went in with the national team then. So it was a 24-year-old, but it was a fantastic experience. It, uh, it taught me about culture. It taught me about language. Uh, I still speak pretty decent Arabic. Can't read or write it, unfortunately. But uh, there was nothing else to do in those days out there. There was there was no TV, so. I was Two hours a day, and had nothing else to do except speak Arabic. So, uh, but that was that was my first professional journey. Out into, then I went on to Australia later. Mm, I see. Okay. 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 Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, Steve, you know, with many legendary managers out there, you know, was there anyone that you drew your inspiration from? You know, perhaps a Sir Bobby or Bill Shankly, Busby, maybe Brian Clough. You know, so which which manager has always been like a role model for you? Oh, well, to me, it, it's literally, there was one, and he's like God to me. That was Bill Shankly. Um, mm-hmm. I was, obviously, I, I was born in Liverpool. I went to Anfield Road School. So I was entrenched in into the into Liverpool Football Club. Uh, they say here, you can change your wife, you can change your religion, but you can't change your football team. And uh, I can't, no matter what, I will always be a Liverpool supporter, but mainly because of Shankly. My dad used to take me to watch Everton, uh, and I used to, he used to make me go there because he was an Evertonian, but Shankly was fantastic. And I was lucky enough to meet him after he'd retired. And I really, really wished there had been smartphones in those days. And I had no <laughs> photograph, I had no recording, but I sat and listened to the man for an hour, and he was absolutely wonderful. People say you should never meet your heroes. This fella, I met him, and he was outstanding. You know, it was a absolute delight to meet him. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there've been others as well. You know, because because I started coaching young, I, I tried to you know copy as many people, read about them, look look go and visit them, watch them work. Because obviously, there was no internet when I first started coaching. People like Malcolm Allison, fantastic coach, uh, Terry Venables, mm-hmm. uh, 
like Arrigo Saki and Capello. I went across to Milan for two weeks to to, to watch them, for, and that was outstanding, Fabio Capello. And I always actually wow. liked called um, Lobanovsky, a Russian coach, who was mm. way ahead of time. Not many people know about him, but he was really using sports science in the 70s. Uh, so there's been a lot of influences. I mean, you'll never be Shankly. Can't be. You can't be Clough. You, you, you've got to be yourself. But mm-hmm. I, I really enjoy listening to other great coaches, watching them. Even if sometimes they do the same session as you and you think, wow, that's great. You know, he's doing the same work as me. Uh, you know, that happened to me once. I, when I was in Australia, I was coaching Sid in the Olympic the, in the National League. And Terry Venables was national coach, and a couple of my players went down to work with him. I said, "What was it like?" You know, and he says, "Oh, it was great, coach. We did exactly the same as you, but it was better." Which uh, so I dropped him. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. I think you have a very colourful uh, character. But uh, in terms of the coaching philosophy, what is the first style that emphasizes a lot of the players? Are you like kind of Antonio Conte, whereby? Are you, you really ask, ask the players to give the maximum output or are you more like a tactical kind of coach? Well, I actually hate the word philosophy nearly as much as I hate the word project. Uh, really? Because having worked in Asia for over 25 years, I've learned there's only one thing that matters in Asia in football. And that philosophy is called winning. Mm. Uh, because if you don't win, you're gone. Yeah, I tell that to my players whenever I meet them first up. I always have like a team meeting because I hate meetings as well. But I have one at the beginning of the season and that's probably it for the year. And I tell them, if we don't win, lads, you'll be speaking to somebody else in the next few weeks. So uh, <laughs> if you want to keep me, keep on winning. But okay. the, the reality is, you know, it's, I'd, I'd, I'd say I'd be called a player's coach. Uh, I've seen some coaches survive by being nice to the media. Some coaches survive by doing what the president says. Uh, my view is you, you've got to you know, die on your feet, not live on your knees. So mm-hmm. I want to work for the players because I think the players are obviously the most important part of the game. And if the players like you and work well with you, you're going to win more games anyway. So to me, it's common sense, but I like to sleep at night. I, I, you know, I like players more than anything else. I tend to have a few battles with administrators and certainly had a few battles with the media. I know that. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so, Steve, you know, you have worked in many countries, you know, Australia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, India, Laos. So I, I'm sure, you know, each and every country has its own working and footballing culture per se. So maybe you can share with us uh, one of your most challenging one and why? Well, challenging is certainly you know, it's a nice word. Like you could say India for a start, because it was a. I've been to India four times, okay. and three were fantastic. One wasn't. That was with Mohammed Gun in in the I League, uh, mm-hmm. and it sounds stupid, but I, I often advise people to be careful what they eat. Well, I didn't do that in India the first time I was there, <clears throat> and believe me, being ill in India with food is scary. I spent one night, literally, I, I went to sleep in the bathroom. It was that bad with the pillow. Oh. And me, you know, I couldn't go anywhere else that quickly. So mm. <laughs> that was awful. But India and Vietnam, there was a couple of things which I really didn't like. And that was the corruption in the game. Uh, not so much mm. match fixing. That's a completely different issue. That was everywhere, match fixing. But uh, <laughs> the corruption of... Oh, oh, Oh yeah, believe me. We all know Kellong goes on. Anyone that says Kellong isn't happening, doesn't happen, or isn't happening is naive. Just, absolutely, you know. Uh, and we can talk about that later if you want. You know, the, the lovely word. I like the word Kellong. It took me years to realise it's a, it's a fishing village. Um, but you get, you know, the corruption of players getting made to get money. When I first went to one club in Asia, the striker said to me, "How much am I, am I going to have to pay you, coach?" And I said, what do you mean? You pay me by scoring goals. He said, no, the previous coach, I had to give a percentage of my wages to him. So he picked me for appearance money and bonuses. I can't oh. stand that. I've never done that. I never will. And there's just the genuine corruption of agents. You know, I've upset quite a few agents because I won't take bonds. Uh, mm-hmm. I won't pay dodgy money under the table. Uh, I mean, that happened in Parak. I, I went to Parak and... 
basically the, what the, the Sultan now, he was the regent then said, just do an honest job, Steve, clean it up. I spoke to one agent and he said to me, right, and we agreed a, a fee for the player. We agreed the player's wages. I think it was great. He said, right, I want 20,000 now, agent's fee. And I said, you're joking, I'm not paying you anything. I said, everything's been done. You know, I didn't ask you to bring the player. You brought the player to me. You know, you, the player pays you. And he said, oh, no, the usual coach, you give me 20 and I'll give you 10,000 back onto the table. And I said, you're asking me to steal 10,000 from Parak. I said, I'm not going to do that. And he said, well, that's what happened before. I said, well, it, it doesn't happen now. It's gone. So <laughs> quite a few agents wouldn't deal with me. I said, I found that out. I mean, and then oh. you get, use the word challenging. I'll try and keep it, you know, Malaysian specific. <laughs> K- Kalantan was a unique challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, fascinating because in Johor and Parak, I survived three seasons in each place. And as you know, three seasons for a Matsale coach is a long time. So that's six years in, in when I lasted three months in Kelantan. Uh, and it was a fascinating place. You know, it was, uh, you had good people, really wonderful people I'm still in contact with. I mean, I used to sit in a, in a restaurant uh, run by a, someone called Mazita Mahmoud. And mm-hmm. she taught me all about the culture of, of Kelantan and, and the place it was. And it was a wonderful place. But... You know, it, there was also some crazy people there, usually on the committee. Uh, so I didn't last very long there. Uh, <laughs> lots of stories about that, but I mean, there's, you know, it's it, it's gone now. It's history, uh, and people laugh and they all they all say Tansi and what I got on well with Tansi. Mm-hmm. He was fine. He wasn't my problem. Uh, I mean, I used to I didn't enjoy three a.m. phone calls, but he used to. <laughs> in the morning. And tell me where I was going wrong, but I mean, he was actually okay. A dec- I found him a decent bloke. It was some of the other people behind the scenes. I think Malaysian people call it unseen hands, and mm-hmm. there was quite oh, a few yes. unseen hands going on behind the scenes at me. So in the end, it was better to get out. You know, it was if you're not enjoying it. Some great players, some dodgy players as well, and you know what I mean by dodgy. Uh, <laughs> yep. Very good ones. Some good people. Okay, I think we, I think we're still talking about Malaysia right now. I think upon your arrival in Malaysia in 1998, you debuted coaching for Johor. Uh, what is Johor compared to in 1998 and now? It, it, it is two different things. What was it managing them back then in 1998? Well, it was like night and day. Believe me. Uh, again, smashing people. So I never had a. I, had a, I was dead lucky. Uh, the word manager meant nothing to me. But in Malaysia, the manager is a very, very important position. He can make or break you. And I was dead lucky. I had a manager called Haji Mohammed Mohammed, and he was fantastic. He said to me, look, Steve, you're CEO on the pitch. I'll be CEO off the pitch, and we'll get on great. And we did for three years. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. But I'll say the difference there. In Johor, I was coach. I was kit man. The balls and nets used to come in the back of my boots of the car. Uh, the bibs, I used to have to wash the bibs, and sometimes I forgot washing them, and they stunk. The players hated to be on the bibs sometimes, because <laughs> uh, I kept them in my boot in my car. We had no dressing room. We used to get play on the polo fields. I had no dressing room. The lads used to get changed uh, behind in the cars, behind a tree. Uh, the, the shower was a hose pipe later. Uh, it was mm-hmm. so different. I mean, it would, there was one day, uh, there was a with a horse and a bloke hitting a polo ball across the pitch. And I was just about to say, please don't do that or something like that. And uh, my captain, Asmi Lazelli, jumped on me and literally held me down, face down in the mud. And I said, what are you doing? He said, coach, you were going to say, please go away, weren't you? I said, yeah. He said, you can't go on my pitch. He said, it's not your pitch, coach. It's his pitch. It was a, <laughs> it was a current salt. We were on his foot playing fields. <laughs> Uh, so I learned very quickly, he said, Coach, if you said that, you wouldn't be here tomorrow. Uh, so I learned, I learned yeah. when to shut up. And Hadji Mohammed taught me a very wise thing. He said, Steve, you've got to be like, if you're in Asia, to survive, you've got to be like bamboo, which is, you don't snap, you bend a little bit. Because it was a bit baffling at first, because there's not much bamboo in Liverpool. So uh, <laughs> I learned, then, I learned you had to bend a little bit you know, and realise that, you know, there's certain things you can't say to certain people. And you, yep. you keep your principles, like, you know, 
or say again, match fiction. I've never ever got involved in that. Uh, I've I've always stood my ground when when I I pick the team, nobody else. If I'm going to get sacked, I'm going to get sacked for my mistakes, not by anybody else's mistakes. So there's certain things I won't do, but I've, I've learned that there's times when you've got to smile, say no, say nothing, and that's where you know Haji Muhammad was fantastic to help me. But even the stadium in those days, Johor Stadium, that you'd come onto the they'd go in the dressing room and it was filthy, cockroaches and and food. There'd be like dead rats in lane three, uh, and even the scoreboard. One day the scoreboard, someone went up up to, to try and fix the scoreboard, it didn't work. He went up, next minute we saw him come flying down the ladder. <laughs> Apparently with was tense. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh, <my. clears throat> I mean, snakes were used on the committee or the media, you know, but, no, but these are real snakes. You know, and, and I mean, <laughs> but, but basically what JDT now is absolutely out of this world. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to say TMJ has put his money where his mouth is, he's delivered, uh, you've got people like Alistair Edwards and Boban working there. One of my ex-players, mm -hmm. uh, Sutesh Nair, is working there. Mm -hmm. Ahmed Sharol, another ex-player of mine, is working there. So he's getting good people involved, good football people, and he's delivered a top-class product. I, I think it's wonderful for, for Malaysian football, and I'm delighted for Johor. You know, it's it's a credit to the game. And of course, you know, with JDT getting stronger every season as you mentioned you know they're setting the bar higher and higher but still you know we're still having all these uh, all sorts of problem in the league you know whereby we're still getting issues of players salaries being unpaid and you know all and whatever problems that you just mentioned that you've gone through in Malaysian football I mean how is it healthy for the Malaysian football league by the way well I, I think it's he's raising the standards he's raising the bar and it's up now for other teams to try and compete with Johor and uh, maybe they've got to find a few more royals. I mean, hey, let's be honest. Even in England, the royalty don't give their money away over here. So, you know, they, nobody's, they don't sponsor football here. But, um, I mean, obviously what the royalty's done in Johor has been fantastic. So maybe some of the others can do that. Uh, or top class, but there's a few multimillionaires. It drive, drives me mad when I saw Proton was sponsoring Norwich when I was there. When I see Cardiff owned by a Malaysian, you know, that person, Vincent Tan, he could actually sponsor the whole league in Malaysia, never mind just a, an English first division club. So, you know, I, I really think the money should be ploughed back into the Malaysian game by Malaysians uh, and have some pride in it because you know, the game is fantastic in Malaysia. The people love it. You know, there's, there's football and there's daylight, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. So, so, Steve, you know, you won the SEA Games gold medal with the Vietnamese uh, women's team in 2001, here in Malaysia, in fact. Uh, and it was pretty much smooth sailing for your team in this tournament, you know, comfortable wins, including the one in the final against Thailand. But, you know, uh, the semi-final was a nail-biter. You know, you, you guys had to go through a penalty shootout against Myanmar. So, perhaps you want to take us through this tournament and where does this success rank among, among all your achievements? Well, in terms of football, you'd have to say not very high. But mm -hmm. in terms of personal level, I'll put it very high because of the way the players were. Uh, I, went to, I went to Vietnam to coach the men's Olympic team. And I started off doing that. And then suddenly I was given an invitation, shall we say, uh, to go and speak to the sports minister. And as my translator said, who was wonderful, she said to me, Coach, there isn't an invitation. You know, you, you're there. You just nod, do what he says, otherwise you're on the next plane home. And he said to me, <laughs> he, he said to me very simply, you're going to coach the women's team. I said, why? He said, well, we don't think the men are going to win the SEA Games gold. Uh, he said, so we're going to put the national coach in there so we can sack him. And we, <laughs> and, uh, he said, but you, you coach the women. And we think you'll, you'll because I've coached the national team of Australian women before, he said, we think you'll win. And I, and I was just about to say, no, I'm sorry. And my translator was kicking me under the table. She was great, stamping on me with her high heels. And I, I realised that I had to say yes. And he said, look, don't worry, your salary's the same, your winning bonus is the same. And I thought, whoa, I've only got to win two games here, realistically. And the, you know, the, the winning bonus was quite good. And to be fair, when we won the gold medal, as we go off the plane, 
he gave me a big fat brown envelope not with Vietnamese dong it was with their dollars so I was very happy but in terms of the players the players were magnificent they were really professional mm -hmm. they were dedicated they were hard working uh, you know you, you couldn't fault them in any way uh, and a lot of them what Vietnam has done well is they've kept a lot of them in the game so a lot of them are coaching or administrators uh, I mean the best example I had was we, we couldn't play other women's teams because we used to beat them all because we were the national team and we couldn't afford to travel out the country so we used to play men's teams so we'd play the national men's under 23s team and what we do was they play one touch and we play free and it worked out some really good games it, it took the power and the speed out of the game it was good for the men uh, uh, and it was great for our, our girls because they physically had to you know, play against good quality players. And other times we would play, say, over 35s or lesser teams and we'd just play them as a normal game. Mm -hmm. And one day we were playing the, uh, the, the expats, the British expat team, you know, a load of matzales. <clears throat> and these were some really posh matzales from private schools. And uh, one of them was, you know, was, was, was moaning to me. He said, oh, you've got to stop your players trying to kick. And, I said, and, I, and he, the next minute, he starts kicking one of our players. And I said, mate, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And he said to me, oh, no, I'm going to do this. You know, we, we will have to sort them out for you. I said, OK, mate, your choice. Five minutes later, he's come off with his foot bleeding, covered in blood. The captain had decided she'd had enough of this rich Matt Sally, And she went sailing in over the top. He had no idea it was coming. He couldn't see it. Smashed his leg. And she just sit there smiling, little tiny five foot three Vietnamese girl, hard as nails she was. And she just laughed and, you know, he would come off to me crying, she kicked me, she kicked me. I said, mate, I told you not to do it. You know, so uh, <laughs> I like those tough, they were hard. And you're right, the, Viet the, the game against Myanmar was, was, you know, was hard. They, it was really funny, one of, the, one of the Myanmar players was sent off and I was... The, as she got sent off, she got sent off, red card. As she's walking off, she punched one of our girls. And my oh. translator saying, she should have two red cards for that. <laughs> you know, I mean, but what you do learn, though, is that you, how important translators are. We were, we were having, one time I said to them, tell them to knock it to the far post. Next minute, the players are pinging it to the <laughs> corner flag. And I said, what did you tell them? She said, you said hit it to the furthest stick. I said, no, I didn't, the far post. You know, it's the, it's the goal and explain what it was. She said, speak English properly then, will you? And then uh, another good example was we were under pressure in a game and I said to her, tell them to flipping well it. It wasn't quite flipping. So I'm sure you know the word yeah. would be. She said, the next minute, I turn around and she's on a little electronic thing. And she says, I said, what are you doing? She says, I know what this flipping is. In fact, I quite like it. She said, but I don't know what this word, she said, I don't know what this word welly is. And I said, and I realized then that you have to change your language when you coach. You can't use slang. You can't use British slang. You've got to use your know, local slang, you know, that type mm. of thing. So, I, you know, I learned that like I learned about duty matter. You know, you've got to use slang in that way. The lads will know what you mean. You know, yeah, so, uh, yeah. but it, but certainly, a lot of respect for the girls. Top class, you know. Yeah, yeah. But Steve, just, just, just one thing. You know, like how, how does it feel like being a coach in a penalty shootout? You know, sometimes you see some coaches they just turn their head away. They don't want to look at their players. You know, kicking those, those, taking those penalties and all that. And because you know, it's just a, it, it's, it basically comes down to a lottery, right? So. Oh, and, oh, oh uh, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I didn't turn my head because, because mm -hmm. basically, I had this captain who was outstanding. And she just, mm -hmm. and as soon as the, we didn't practice penalties, because I often don't think you can, you should, I think you should practice your goalkeeper saving penalties because they've got five chances of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the, the one off kick, kick, anything can happen. But the captain said to me, she, she came off the pitch and said, don't worry, coach, I'll choose the five. I know who the five will score. And then I looked at my goalkeeper and my goalkeeper, she was great. She was a, Big, daft, lazy goalkeeper, but she saved everything. And she said, in Viet, because I spoke a little bit of Vietnamese by then, she said, don't worry, coach, I'll save them. And she did. <laughs> you know, it was all, it was so, and then we beat the ties, you know, it was, uh, we knew yeah. we'd beat and we And to be fair, we were dead lucky. We got a, we got a couple of penalties, which are never penalties. I don't think it was Kellong, not in the women's game, <laughs> but, but it was, uh, it was, 
it, it, it was happy to get two penalties in that game, and once we, and they, we banged them away, and it was we were never going to lose the final. And it, you, you should have seen the pride of these girls when they were singing the national anthem. You know, it was ah oh, wonderful to see because it meant something to them. You know, they were playing for their country. You know, they weren't playing for themselves. They really were playing for Vietnam. Hmm. Okay. Hey. Okay. I think you have a very impressive resume after you win the Sea Games gold medal with Vietnam. But uh, also, there's a. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. There's a link between you and the Indian national team. But uh, instead, you opted for Para. Uh, is it? Is there any reason why you're not keen in managing the Indian national team, or is it because no. the food you having a difficulty? <laughs> Was it like food poisoning? Well, incident? basically, uh, as you as you say in 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 football, it must be true if it's in the paper. I <laughs> honestly never had an approach from India, and I okay. but, hmm. but an Indian paper wrote that they that I was going to be approached, and it just spread. I mean, it probably it probably was a Bengali paper, because I learned over there that the Bengali papers were absolutely wonderful things. Uh, I I once had, uh, you've heard of Sunil Chetri. He came to me mm, one day yeah. and said, Coach, you've got a great quote in the paper. Here. You're abusing me. And then he knew that I never abuse players in, in public ever. I'll speak one to one, you know, not, or in the dressing room with the lads, but I'll never abuse a player publicly. And I said, What are you talking about? And he showed me a Bengali paper, and I was steaming mad. So I rang up the editor. I said, What are you doing? I've never said these words. And the editor, he said, Oh, don't worry, coach. He said, uh, The bloke has to put a story in, otherwise he wouldn't have got paid. And he said he missed you. He was too. He slept in for the your your press conference, so he made it up. I said you oh. can't do. That. <laughs> well. He said, he said, well we do, and he wasn't even worried. He said, oh it's good copy. It, we are. <laughs> We're sure everyone's talking about you having a go at Chetri. I said I don't do that, and I but I lost the battle. They just didn't. They thought I was stupid. So I mean. Basically, the Indian one was was purely paper talk. Uh, I would have, I probably would have taken it. I'll be honest, but but then Parak came in, and that wasn't paper talk. Uh, Datu Jamal called me because I'd met him. We played uh, when I was with Home United. We played against Parak uh, in that time, and when I'd been at Johor, and yeah, you know, I knew some of the Parak players. Uh, you know, I liked a lot of the players. They made me an offer. It was a great offer, so I took it, and I, I really enjoyed my time in Parak. Yeah, so now I can say I think it's Ipo Mali. You know, it was, it was really good. Mm, okay, okay. Ipo Mali, okay. Ipo Mali, yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you had a great time with Terra. I mean, I think three years with them, I think you achieved quite a quite amount of success. Um, was there any opportunities that came knocking on your door to manage the Malaysian national team back then? I mean, if, if there wasn't, I mean, any reason why you didn't get the offer? Uh, No, I'll be honest. I, I never got an offer. Uh, I mean, there's no point. In, I, I see, I see a couple of coaches these days say, "Oh, you know, I'm going to be offered this." I'm going. To, they're telling stories. They know that other agent is. You know, they're trying to buff themselves up a bit. But no, I honestly never got an offer. Uh, I would love to have taken the national team without a doubt, uh, because I, there's been some really, really good uh, Malaysian team coaches. I, and I, I'll be honest, I think Satyan did a great job. Uh, Rajagopal did a great job. I mean, there's been a couple of really good ones, but there's also been quite a few clowns and imposters, usually the foreigners, to be honest. Uh, they've just come in and it's a wonderful phrase, uh, grin and bank it. I think some of them just come in for the money and got in and got out, uh, which is, I think, a disgrace. I mean... Having had seven years in seven seasons in Malaysia, yeah, you know, to me it would have been a personal thing. I would have wanted to do well for Malaysia, but no, I never got offered it. Uh, and the reason why I imagine I probably upset a few too many people in FAM because I used to tend to, I tended to speak my mind, which I've learned sometimes isn't the wisest thing. But I, I think if you're in the game and the game matters, you have to have an opinion. And you don't have to disagree with me. That's fine. I don't mind if someone disagrees with me. Uh, but you know, I respect people who who would argue with me. But I think in some cases they didn't like, you know, the the Matsale particular thing. Matsale coming in saying we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't do that. You know, it's not a case of that. I mean, but I was speaking for my players. I was never speaking for, for Steve Darby. I was always speaking for the Malay, you know, the the, the players, whether it be Parak or Johor. So I imagine I upset a few people, and I would never grin and bank it, as people say. Uh, but yeah, I would love to have done it. 
Mm, okay. No. Yep. All right, Steve. So, uh, you know, with, with Vietnam and Thailand uh, having improved tremendously in the last few years, you know, you can include Malaysia in this group as well. You know, uh, what, <clears throat> what do you think is the next step for these nations, you know, in order to close the gap on the bigger teams in Asia, like Japan, Korea, and all those Middle Eastern teams? Well, I think the first thing is you've got to have a strong local, local league. Uh, and in the case of Vietnam, they've got to stop the corruption in the league because that's rampant. Match fixing is rampant in the V League, and they've got to fix the pitches because of some great players, and they're playing on absolute, you know, fields where you can grow potatoes. Uh, <laughs> Malaysia used to have some fantastic. <laughs> I mean, Perlis was like a Perlis and Sarawak were like bowling greens. Now it, it went bad after a while. You know, the World Youth Cup was fantastic for those clubs. I mean, I know it's difficult in Malaysia because there's certain types of grass, the cow grass and the sea grass, but. Uh, that's the thing. Thailand and Vietnam, I think, should be up there with with Korea and Japan. They have the, the playing personnel. They also have the population. You know, you've got over 80, 80 million people in both these countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, never mind, in Indonesia is a different matter. They've got 200 million, but they've just got chaos everywhere, haven't they? You know, yep. they're just shambles. But, you know, great players. But, uh, so that's the first thing I think they've got. They've got to stop the corruption in the leagues. And then the next thing is they've got to start doing what, what Thailand are doing, is Thailand has started to export players. Now, it would be great to export them to Europe, but that's not always going to happen because of visa requirements. Uh, and I think the next thing is they should start to exporting uh, the players to, to, to Japan or Korea or China. Mm -hmm. Thailand are doing that. They've got Tiraton, they've got Carwin, uh, your players like this who have gone. Uh, Tiraton has, has gone to... Spain and tried it for a while uh, but that's the next step because you'll come back a better player you'll not only come back a better player you'll come back a better person you'll come back stronger and tougher because it's not easy being a foreigner you know, I knew that when I first went to Australia I was playing as the foreigner there I used to get battered physically because you were, you were well you weren't a Matali there you were called a pommy and usually a second word after it as well, a pommy something. But uh, I, I used to get battered, but yeah, it toughens you up. You either learn not to, not to take it and give in, or it makes you harder. And you learn you have to you know, get tough enough to play the foreigner role. Now, not many Vietnamese have done that yet. A lot of it's with language. They don't speak you know, second language. Whereas I think the Malays, they tend to do that. And I used the example of Carwin. Carwin was the goalkeeper in my Sea Games team. Mm -hmm. And he was a smart lad, a very smart lad. He stopped eating rice. He started eating pasta because he knew he'd have to adapt if he went abroad. He started doing English lessons because he knew no one's going to speak Thailand, you know, in Belgium where he went. Uh, so he says, but I know they'll speak English. So he's a smart lad. Uh, and he, that's why he'll make it. Mui or Tirasen, they call him Mui, uh, he was more of a happy-go-lucky lad. He didn't like training, but he loved playing. And that's probably why he didn't quite make it in Spain. Had the talent, but he's happier in Thailand. So, but he's now gone to Japan, and he'll he'll get a couple of years out of his. You know, he'll be able to retire a happy lad in Thailand. But that's the, to me the next thing. Those two, Malaysia should be there with your know, Thailand and Vietnam, and they should be competing because they have the the playing abilities there. And I'll say this again. I'm not just saying it. There's some top class local coaches that I really do believe that of some excellent coaches. You know, there's a list of them I could name, you know, who, who are good at their job. And so it should be there. I would say what we've got to look at in Malaysia in particular and in the other two places is the quality of the administration. The players are good. The coaches are good. I don't talk about referees because they break my heart. But, uh, <laughs> but the administration, I think, is the, is the key. Get, let's get some top-class administrators in. And that's starting to happen. You're getting a lot of now bright, young, educated lads in, in club football and in some cases in the FAs. Uh, and that's what you need. Not political. You don't need politicians anymore. You know, they're not there for the game. They're just there for their own power and using football. <clears throat> Get some people who see administration as a career path and, you know, and, and they love the game as well. That's what, and, and highly educated. And I think Malaysia's certainly got... You know, Things like the PFA in Malaysia, I think, are wonderful. You know, Rizal Zambri, an ex-player of mine, I'm delighted.
delighted that he's involved in that. Now, there's a lad who gave his debut at 18, uh, and his name was Ikan then, and uh, he's now the head of the PFA. Absolutely delighted. Intelligent young man, now giving something back to the game. Hmm. I think, wow, we have a very good uh, explanation of why we need, how we can close the gap in Asia. Uh, I'm sure as a coach, we have managed over, over hundreds of players, uh, from women to men football. Possible, can you able to mention three best players we have worked with so far? Oof. Right. Let me think. Um, Challenge, I guess. <laughs> in, in, in terms of pure talent, I'd have to go for Nicholas and Elka. Uh, okay. had, him at, had him at Mumbai. Uh, when, the, it, when, we, when we were in the ISL, Indian Super League, what happened there, the president signed the players. <clears throat> that, was the, that was the way it was done. I was with Peter Reid uh, and we accepted it because we knew that. And he, he came up to us and said, I've just signed Nicholas and Elke. And we both went, oh no, because we thought it is, the immediate image was terrible. Oh yes. But, yes. but when we, and he'd just been banned in England. When he came, you could not have got a more humble man, a more professional man, uh, absolute dedicated pro, uh, super fit. He, he stayed back after training and say to me, Steve, can you help me with some shooting? How could oh. I help him? He knew he smashed the net every time. He destroyed the goalkeepers. He was that good. And he didn't moan about the, the pitches were terrible where we played in India. He didn't care about the pitches. And... He was on good money, let's be honest, really good money. But he used to look after the Indian boys on the quiet. He did the right thing, personally and professionally. And if I said be there at nine, Nick was there, 8.55. If I said wear the pink socks, Nick would wear pink socks. Not a problem at all with him. So, and as I say, what a player. You know, but anyway, so, so in terms of talent, <clears throat> to look at the Malaysian, probably the best player I've had in Malaysia and very few will probably re understand or believe this. His name is Shauki, played for Kelantan. He was, there's a lad there who had 70 caps for Egypt, played in front of 100,000 every week in Al Ahly, um, scored in, in the Confederations Cup semi final against Brazil. Uh, okay. And humble as they come, and dedicated, top class professional. Didn't have a single problem with him. You know, I had four four foreigners at Kelantan, and oh, you know, I had a lot of problems. Believe me, believe me, some of the problems I had. You know, I. Uh, but Shauki was the opposite. Absolute mega professional, and he used to do things that you know, were unseen on the pitch. The fans didn't appreciate him. Uh, I mean, he used to literally look after Pia on the pitch. You know, he'd let. He'd do the twice, because Pia never defended, we all know that. You know, Pia went, went forward and was great going forward, but he didn't fancy defending Pia. So, Schalke used to do two men's jobs there. So, he'd be one player. And the final one you might have heard of, you might have, because I had him a couple of times, uh, Sutty Suksomkit. I had him in, uh, I signed him in, in Singapore for Home United. And what a great lad. Um, Good player, no matter what. Powerful, fantastic scorer, you know, but also he had, a, he had a personality to die for. He he couldn't speak English. Uh, so I, I sat and I, he said, coach, teach me. So he would come to my house in the afternoons and I, and I taught him English. So he wanted to learn to be a better person like that. Uh, and he told me a story eventually. He, when he was 14, he decided to leave school. He didn't like school. And he lived on a little tiny island in Thailand, uh, off the coast of Thailand. He borrowed a thousand baht, got on an 18 hour bus journey, went to Bangkok, knocked on the door of the coach, a fellow called Chanvit, who was a very good coach, a Thai farmer's bank. And he said, I want to be a footballer. So Chanvit found out where he was from, how he got there, put him up in the, in the accommodation they had at 14, you know, and, he, and he made it. And he told me the wow. first salary. First salary he got, he paid the bloke back the thousand baht he borrowed to get the bus fare. So I thought, what a character. I mean, yeah. and when I went to Thailand with Reedy, the national team had been picked for us because it was we came in very late. And I looked at the squad and I said, there's no sooty. And he just laughed at me, Reedy, who's this sooty? I said, hey, we'll get him in. I said, watch what will happen in the dressing room. 
So I rang Sochi up. He said, oh, yeah, coach, I'd love to play nationally. He, he devoted to Thailand, you know. Came in the dressing room and really said, it was like the whole place lit up. Everyone loved him. And I was so happy when he scored. He scored against Liverpool. And he okay. should have seen the light on his face, you know. And it was the strong Liverpool side. Uh, the only good thing was he didn't do what... If you remember Datsacorn, Datsacorn nutmeg mascarano. And I went, oh, no, you don't nutmeg an Argentinian. And then... <laughs> Because that's going to clattered 10 minutes later by Mascarano. <laughs> but um, Sutty was a, Sutty was a, we would, be, would be up there. So you've got an Elke, Schalke, Sutty, all for different reasons. But uh, I'm, if I'm going to include female players, uh, Luung from the captain of Vietnam, because she had character to die for. You know, she, she was me on the pitch for me, you know, and she was a wonderful girl. Okay, okay. I mean, those are, those are some uh, extraordinary names that you mentioned, especially on Nicholas and Elka. I mean, a, as you would have mentioned that, you know, the, 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 the image that he portrayed himself on the media has always been negative, but turns out to be one professional football player for you. Um, let's I mean, you look, uh, oh. you look, I mean, you look at some of the players as well in Malaysia like this. I always remember one night we were, we were at, I was at Johor, we were at Negri Sembalan, and it was like monsoon as usual. And Negri's pitch was lousy, and it was horrible nights. And we went one nil down. I went, oh no! And next minute, I looked, and Rizal, Rizal Sukerman, remember him? Yeah. He just turned around and looked at me, rolled his sleeves up, pulled them above his shoulder like he used to, and just gave me the thumbs up and said, "Don't worry." And he kicked his way through the team. But I thought, oh, what a character he was. Ahmed Sherul, great, great captain in Pirak. Though I had one, one day I rescued his career because I think he was about to kill the referee. He'd just been sent off. And there's a great picture, in the, I think it's the Haria Metro or somewhere, of literally me on his shoulders dragging him off because he'd, he'd have gone for life. If he, you know, he was going to kill the referee. But he, I mean, he was, <laughs> he was, ded, he was de dedicated. I felt so sorry for him in the Malaysia Cup final when we played Keda. He got sent off in, I think, the 25th minute his first tackle, and when you look at the you look at the replay, the referee is almost pulling his card out before he made the tackle. I won't say it was fixed. It certainly wasn't fixed by Kedder, because I've got a lot of respect for people like Azrai Kaur. I think you know, the Kedder treble was fantastic, and they were good players, you know, uh, your Marlon, uh, people like that. Your book, and also excellent coach in Azrai Kaur. No, no disrespect to them, but some of the decisions made by the referee that day, oh my God, you know, it was just disgraceful. But you can't prove it, so what can you do about it? You know, it's, uh, it breaks your heart. <laughs> okay, that's true, that's true. Uh, let's, let's move on to something that is more current. And as you know, Emmett, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, obviously it affected football on a global scale. A lot of leagues had to be postponed and a lot of fixtures had to be put, uh, you know, put on hold. But how do you see the future of football moving forward after this? I mean, do, do you possibly see this, a, a new norm in, in it? Well, it, it's fascinating. And you know what they're more concerned about? When the Premier League is going to start again. <laughs> or, will, or will League One get relegation and things like this? That's all they're talking about. Okay, you can add as well when the pubs open. But I mean, but the football... That is the power of football. Jürgen Klopp, who I think is a wonderful coach and a very clever man, uh, he actually said, football is the most important of the least important things. He said, obviously, your health is the most important thing. He said, but of all the other things that are not important, football is the most important. I understood what he meant because it means something to people, football. It, 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 just, it gives something you know, to talk about. Everywhere you go in the world, you can talk about football. Someone will know somebody. Someone, you know, you'll have a connection through the football. So I don't know what Southeast Asia has done. They've done a wonderful job keeping the death rate down to what it is. But will it change football? I, I don't know. I mean, I, we haven't seen a game yet without crowds here. So I don't know what it's going to be like. But uh, <clears throat> I've watched the Bundesliga. It's not too bad. And the sound is okay. But um, I really, the answer is I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but I think football will adapt. It always does. Football will survive because the people want to survive. It's the people's game. 
you know, that will never change. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So, so still on the topic of uh, of COVID, yes, <coughs> yes, Steve, and uh, since you mentioned the Bundesliga as well, you know, uh, and we have seen some of these shots on TV and all that, where you know you get. Uh, players sitting on the bench, you know, and those guys are all fully masked up, wearing masks and all that. But of course, then they get on the field and everything. There's basically no sort of social distancing at all, you know, or physical distancing for that matter. So, you know, what's your take on this? Is it, you know, wearing the mask and then removing the mask and then going all out and playing? It's just... Well, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a bit silly. A lot of it is for cosmetic purposes. I mean, they've got to go through the motions of putting the masks on. Mo most people in Asia wear masks. They don't wear them in Liverpool. No one will wear a mask in the street here. It just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. well, so they're going to you know, wear these masks, I think, for cosmetic purposes. But as you say, I mean, it's been raised on one of the radio stations. One of the ex-players said, well, if I was a centre forward and the centre half was marking me in the box, I'd start coughing. <laughs> I mean, what does he do? Does he still stand next to me when I'm gone? <laughs> or does he run away and not mark me and I'll be free? And if someone's going to do that eventually. Someone like Luis Suarez, I'm sure, would do that. He'd be coughing and sneezing and no one in the box is going to mark him, are they? So uh, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff is you can't have socially distanced. Though then again, I've coached a few teams where my defenders were socially distanced and attackers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's some of my defenders, some of the goals we let in at Kalantan. Oh, the certain player who I used to go, What are you doing? And I knew what he was doing, but I mean, uh, you know, he was certainly social distancing. <laughs> wow. okay, okay, I think on a serious note, uh, currently, I think Singapore started with the naturalized players initially. Uh, but not since Malaysia also started doing in the name of Surame, Kumari, sorry, to, to represent the, uh, Malaysia. So what, what's your take in the national team opting for national space? Is it healthy or for, for the team or is it uh, unhealthy in terms of the you know, local talents and being put aside? It's a, it's a fascinating problem and complex because I think if a person, I'll stick it in the Malaysian context, if a player has a Malay parent, like Brendan Gan, for example, I think there's nothing wrong with him playing. Nothing wrong with playing for his country. You know, if he feels Malaysian, good luck to the lad. Um, I don't think the idea of someone being here five years can make you a Malaysian. I, I don't think. And that, what that will do is it will encourage mercenaries, I'll be honest. And to put that in context, I've had this, when I was at Home United, uh, I had two players, Subramanian and Adi Iskander, 100 caps each for Singapore, love the country loved Singapore and one of our other teammates was Egmar Gonzalez who was given the you know the, the the Brazilian Brazilian player and he was given a Singapore passport to play because he'd been there more than five years now they were mates of Egmar and it was not personal but they didn't want Egmar to play uh, because they said it's not right we'd rather lose as Singaporeans than than win with foreigners and when they won if you remember the Singapore won the Suzuki Cup you had loads of for John Wilkinson, uh, Furadin. For they had a number of players. And they had, of course, a couple of lads brought over from Africa, Nigerians, who, let's be honest, they came over purely for mercenary reasons, you know, as which you know, most of them were. So I, I'm convinced half, half, you know, half nationality, no problem. But the other one, no, I don't really think it's right. I would have loved to have played for England. I wasn't good enough. End of story. And whenever I used to get my players chosen for the national team, I was delighted for them. I mean, it's funny, the one I was really pleased for was S. Uh, S. Subramanian when he got his Malaysian cap. Because uh, he, he was a fascinating character. With Parak, we were playing. We, and I took in a friendly... I used to take Parak to friendlies and you should try and have some easy friendlies to batter teams to get in some shooting practice and things like this. And we went to a plantation to play. I'd never been to a plantation before. That was fascinating. But <laughs> we played U UPB, <coughs> the plantation team. And Keita Manju, I said, Keita, I want you to get six goals today. And yeah, coach, no problem. And Keita got kicked all over the park by this lad at the back. Uh, and it was Subramanian. And he batted, batted Keita. 
you know, so end of the game, I walked up to him and you could see Subra, he was almost going to go white. He thought I was going to abuse him. So I put my hand out. I said, son, well done. You're a great player. You're coming to us. And he said, you're joking. I said, no. I said, you're a great player. He did a fantastic job on Keita Manju. Not many Emily defenders could did the same job. Uh, and, and Keita was great. Keita said, coach, sign him. I don't want him kicking me. I want him <laughs> with my hand, you know. Uh, he said so. And he came. He was a good professional, wanted to get better. And when he got chosen for Malaysia, I was so happy for him because it really meant something to him you know, to rise from the plantation to the national team. And he played against Chelsea and things like that. You know, what a fantastic climb up the ladder for the lad. Wonderful character. Mm. Okay. But, but do you think that, you know, there, there could be a balance of this between, you know, having some players to, you know, sort of like, uh, or close the gap that is lacking in the national team, while at the same time the FA should continue to you know nurture young talent, develop programs to to ensure that you know the next pool of talent comes out, we're able to you know you know fulfil what was lacking in the national team before. Uh, my good feeling is no. I think they've got to stick with the youth development programs, and they've got to stick with them, not just try them for two years and then change to another one. And then say, bring a Barcelona in, then bring Bayern Munich in, then bring somebody else in. It doesn't work. You know, I think for, lo you know, for youth, local youth development, you've got to have really good coaches. And I think local coaches, because of the language and the culture, bring them through, get them into the, into the M League, professionalize the M League, and, and it will get better. They will find a higher level. Bring in the half Malaysian people, no problem with that. And but I, I'm not a fan of bringing in the mercenaries. Uh, I mean, you can say like Daniel Bennett, for example, he, he came to Singapore when he was two. So he had 20 years as a Singaporean. So I don't class that as a mercenary. You know, so if they've been bought in, you know, I'm not a fan of that. I, I think Malaysia is better than that. They don't know. I mean, I had that problem in, in when I was in Laos. I wanted to bring in half Lao people because there's about five half Lao, French Lao people playing in the, in the French League 1. Oh. And there I, was, there I was in Lao getting battered as national team coach. And I'm thinking, I've got lads who were playing in League 1 who wanted to play, but it wasn't the Lao football, it was the Lao government. They wouldn't allow a player to play unless he gave up his French citizenship. Now, let's be honest, you're not going to give up the citizenship of France because they ain't couldn't have played in France, could they? They had to have played in Laos. That's not going to happen. So it was a government problem. And even Vietnam did that first time. They, they now allow half Vietnamese, but they won't allow uh, people who are, who are like the mercenaries, I'll say, because they nationalized a couple of South Americans at first. The FA did that. They allowed it. But then the, the, the Communist Party came in and said, no. It ain't gonna happen. You've got to be a Viet to play for Vietnam, and I respect that. I mean, that's that. That is my view. You live or die on your own talent, I think, and the quality of your development programs and the quality of your national league. Mm. But they're talking about that. I think naturalized players are more like a short-term fix compared to a long-term fix in terms of program development. So, like country, like you know, having like uh, less talent or pool, uh, you still you still going with the they should not do it. Yeah, I mean, did, did Malaysia enjoy Singapore winning the Suzuki Cup? No way, because yeah. there was five or six foreigners in it. You know, and it, it was like, almost like, well, that's not fair in a sense. You know, I think it should be a level playing field and you get there on your own ability. I mean, and if you go short term, what are you going to win? I mean, I used to talk about this. If you're in Laos or Cambodia, winning the Suzuki Cup is fantastic. That should be your goal because... That is where your level is. Let's be the size of the country, population, quality of the football inside, etc. But if you're Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, and probably Indonesia should be, to be honest, they should be saying, well, Suzuki Cup's nothing. We should, or Sea Games, you know, that should be something that's okay, we're there, we compete, but we should be looking for, to get into the Asian Cup. We should be looking to get in the World Cup qualifiers, the next level, and things like this. I wrote a program when I was in Thailand. In, I was in Thailand 2008 
to 11. And I wrote a program in 2010 and I called it Thailand 22. And it was about qualifying for 22 World Cup, you know, the one coming up. And if they'd implemented it, they'd have had a pool of players available because I was looking at ages and, and getting a large pool of young players with good local coaches in all over the country. But of course, it was never going to be implemented, you know, because as I said, we come back to that word in administration. The administrators don't see 10 years as being a goal. They see the next vote keeping their job. You know, I mean, I, I used to find it hilarious when I was in Malaysia when the World Cup was on. How many people used to go and get from, to go to the World Cup from, from FAM? <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> and I'd see them going on, on uh, educational tours to the J League. It was wonderful shopping trips, weren't they? You know, <laughs> how many of these working parties we seen and nothing came back for the game? You yeah. know, send, send some of the good coaches over. You know, send some of the good local coaches on assignment to some of these places. So they come back and they work with the local players. Don't send, a, you know, 40 administrators over to do a working party and look at the shopping trip. You know, that's what they were. And yet the World Cup, how many tickets went to some of them? You know, uh, as you can see, that's why I never got the FA coaching job and probably why I'll never get that. Uh, <laughs> I'll never see that at Derby. Yeah. Mm, all right, all right. Okay. okay. Um, any, any last words, guys, to Steve Darby? Uh, Steve, just just one thing I'd like to uh, ask you. You know, uh, having moved from your football manager role to going into media and punditry and all that, you know, uh, can, can you share with us any interesting story or some funniest moment you experienced on TV? Well, I mean, I tell you what, it's a lot easier being a pundit because mm -hmm. you get something called hindsight. <laughs> you know, which is great. Yeah, and I, I've never made a mistake in hindsight. Uh, and also, nobody throws a bottle of liquid at you, which looks like whiskey in colour, but maybe isn't whiskey. Uh, that, that, that happened the first time I went to Kelantan, and the bottle exploded by me. And I thought, oh, oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and my manager, Haji Ahmed, said to me, whatever you do, Steve, don't throw it back. Because I was going to throw it back. He said, you're in Kalantan, you didn't go to Peru, you'll get eaten alive. So uh, <laughs> I took his advice on that one. But um, being a pundit is easier. Uh, but I mean, I've had one fellow pundit fall asleep on, on, the, on the desk next to me, literally. Uh, you remember John Dykes? Uh, on his yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Top class, top class, uh, you know, a real professional. You realize the difference in pros and amateurs like me. And it, they have everything organized on ESPN. So, for example, I would answer the first and the third question, and the other pundit would answer the second and the fourth question. And John asked me my question the first, yeah, no problem. Next minute, he asked me the second pundit's question. And I looked at him because I had no answer. <laughs> so I hadn't prepared it. And then he got me around it, and I answered it because then they, they, they shot to me and showed me. The other pundit, who I won't name, he fell asleep. <laughs> so, and then I saw one of the cameramen creeping on the floor underneath the camera, tapping him to wake him up. So uh, <laughs> you, you had that. And I had another pundit from England this time. He came across and he said to me, will you answer all the questions except about Man United? I said, why? He said, I don't know anybody else except Man United. <laughs> he said, I, I don't know anything. I don't watch football. I said, you're joking. He said, no, I don't really like it. He said, but he, he got a free trip out to you know, Singapore. <laughs> so it was, uh, oh, you know, fasc fascinating. And, uh, and in terms of being interviewed, I was interviewed once. I was in Damascus with uh, Parak. And we were, we were on the pitch, sorry, with Home United, playing in Syria in Damascus. And I was being interviewed uh, and there was lots of lads behind me. Next minute, I had my pocket picked while I'd been live on television. And, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I'm trying to present people and talking. And as a little lad, I had his hands in my pocket. You know, I'm trying to belt him away. And little, but they kept on interviewing me. <laughs> you, you learn that. I mean, and you do learn that. The main thing is you've got to do your homework. You know, I, I had one in Malaysia where uh, I was with another, another pundit. And he, he said, right, you've got a few minutes. I've got to go to the toilet. He went, the, you know, it's human, that happens. He went to the toilet. He never came back. And I'm going, <laughs> and the next minute, the bloke speaking to me, 
down the line. And he spoke, he was speaking in Bahasa. Now, fortunately, as you know, I got a little bit of Bahasa. So I replied in my broken Bahasa and he realized he was smart and a little good pro. He realized I was on my own. So he changed back to English. And that was, uh, <laughs> that, was oh, that was good. But it was, uh, it, you know, Malaysian TV was fascinating because uh, the most important part was Macan. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. As long as the lads got Mac and the cameramen, that they were happy. You know, and you, and you learn very early in television. Look after mm. your cameraman because he can make you look stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you know? hey, 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 Steve. Since since you mentioned about makan, you know, being in Malaysia for so long, what's your favorite local dish here? So at least you know we know what uh, where to take you out to makan next time you're around. Uh, I, I love Indian Malay food, uh, roti canai. And uh, ah, oh, I still okay. love that. But, okay. but with sauce, sikit sikit pedas. Because uh, okay. <laughs> I, I went in, I went into one restaurant. Chebby Singh took me into a restaurant, and he gave me this, this sauce, and I honestly thought my head was going to explode. <laughs> I've never seen anything like. It. I said, Chebby, you cannot put that in your mouth. And he went and showed me what I dipped it in, ate it. And he said, hey, you mad salaries, you can't take it out here, can you? You know, so it was off oh, a legend. But you know, I used to love that roti canai. Yeah, it was my favorite. Okay, did that. roti canai, all right. Okay, okay. And no, and no, no beer because it's haram, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, nothing, <laughs> nothing. Okay, okay, right. As I tell my lads, you can drink halal beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Okay, any, any, any last words, Steve, before we wrap up this episode? No, I just, you know, I, I, I'd love my time in, in Malaysia. I've had the longest time in my football career, really, is in Malaysia, seven seasons. Uh, it's really funny that the, since I've, I've been back in England, and I'll be honest, I came back to England because my mum was getting old, and mm -hmm. so I've got to do the right thing that way. And since I haven't been looking for jobs, I've been offered three None in Malaysia, I might add, and I never lie about things like that. A couple in Indonesia, one in Maldives, but I certainly would, you know, would would go back to Malaysia. You know, no, I wouldn't mind another go Kelantan, but as long as I chose not the players, as long as I chose me on committee this time. <laughs> <laughs> and let's let's hope another bottle doesn't go flying. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I've, got soft, okay. I've got a soft spot for Kalantan. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Okay, all right, guys. Any any last word, guys? Uh, no, in fact, uh, thank thank you so much, Steve. You're one you're one funny man, and we really had fun here, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Thank you so much, Steve, for your time, and uh, it's a very interesting interview. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 I, mean, I have to say this as well. Been one of the most fun podcasts we ever had, and thank you so much, Steve. Yeah. You brought yeah. Yeah. you really brought the light in this in this whole discussion. Yeah, I mean, there's so much yeah. that we've learned from you, and uh, you know, we have, we will. We hope that our listeners will enjoy this uh, this episode, and uh, of course, you know, uh, everyone here loves Steve Darby for your years of uh, working in Malaysian football. A lot of fans still remember you for all the good times that and all the great things you've done. And uh, with that said, we will wrap up this episode and goodbye. <laughs>